break every chain. Break every chain. Anybody know this chain breaker? Hallelujah. Anybody know this chain breaker? Yeah. It's Jesus, yeah. the King of Kings, Jehovah, Lion of Judah. He is Jehovah, yeah. the chain breaker. Hallelujah. He can break any chain, every chain. We thank you for Jesus, the chain breaker. We welcome you today. We thank you. Thank you for joining us. We thank God's blessing and mercy that has kept us throughout the week. And we thank you for his peace. We thank you for his joy. We thank you for his covering. And we thank you for his grace. And we thank you for breaking every chain. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Galatians 6 verse 10 says, as, Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Lord, we are so grateful come into your presence to worship you, to give you honor and glory of the special gift, your son, Jesus Christ. He's our chain breaker. We thank him for breaking the chain of dysfunction, poverty, illness. We thank him for breaking the chain of unforgiveness. We thank him for breaking the chain of depression, anxiety, and fear. And we thank him for replacing it with peace and joy. That we worship you today, Father. We pray that your presence will be among us, through us, and around us. We are ready for the word, dear Father. Help us to apply it to our hearts and our life and to be a witness and testimony. We give you praise and our glory. We will be careful, dear Father, to let everyone know that Jesus is our chain breaker. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for Jesus.
continuation of our series on courage to serve. And I believe that the Holy Spirit kept the most relevant message for this one. So we are in the second book of Kings, the eighth chapter. verses 1 through 3. If you are able, wherever you are, you can join us by standing in reverence to the word of God. 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. This is what the Bible says. Elisha had told the woman whose son he had brought back to life, take your family and move to some other place. For the Lord has called for a famine on Israel that will last for seven years. So the woman did as the man of God instructed. She took her family and settled in the land of the Philistines for seven years. After the famine ended, she returned from the land of the Philistines and she went to see the king about getting back her house and land. Father, we thank you for the word. I humbly hide behind the cross. Speak to us that we may hear from you a word that will encourage, enlighten, and inspire. Push us past an academic experience into a life-altering moment. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. In the presence of the Lord, please take your seat. If we had to give today's message a title, it would be The Function of God's Favor. Yeah, the function of God's favor. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just dive right on in. Church hurt can be one of the most devastating experiences of life. One of the reasons that church hurt can be so devastating is that we feel like in the church hurt shouldn't exist. I do believe, though, Doc, that there's less hurt in the kingdom than there is in church. Because in the kingdom, there is submission to the will and way of God. So activating the courage to serve does not create a cushion of protection. Problems, persecutions, and pain will still knock on your door. But all of the above aligns us to discover the function of God's favor. In other words, if you haven't activated the courage to serve, chances are you won't experience too much church hurt because you're not a threat to the enemy's plan. But the moment you become a threat to his plan by being activated in the kingdom of heaven as an ambassador, now you create issues for the enemy. And they will use problems, persecution, and pain. <clears throat> but the thing is, we don't really need God's favor if we don't have any issues. If you can pay all your bills, if your life is perfectly smooth on a sea of glass, 
you feel like you have one foot in heaven and the other one on a banana peel, what do you need God for? But when all hell breaks loose, because of the work that you're doing, it can throw you for a loop. So this message today is, is really about understanding that the function of God's favor is that he restores us. Somebody should have said amen. That's a guarantee. You can take it to the bank and cash a check. Elisha called her the Shumanite because she was from the city of Shunan. But Elisha knew her personally because she was a servant for this man of God. He came into town and she welcomed him into her home. They fixed him a meal and allowed him to spend the night. And every time he came into town, they would invite him to come. And the Bible says that this was a wealthy family. So they decided that they were going to build an apartment for Elisha and his servant Gehazi. Y'all know Gehazi was the guy who got leprosy because he was stealing. And so we have this situation that this woman who was a wonderful host, who was gracious with the abundance of prosperity that God had given her, but something was missing in her life. And so one day, Elisha calls her up into the apartment that they had built for them, and he says, what can I do for you? And she says, sir, all is well. She's not complaining. She's not speaking the pain that's in her heart. And when she left, Gehazi says, but Lord, her husband is old, and they have no children. And Elisha says, call her back. Because the function of God's favor is that he restores us by shifting us from barrenness to birth. Some, some of y'all are going to understand that right away. <clears throat> Where the hopes that you had, the visions that you had, the ideas that you knew that God had made potentially possible in you just didn't seem to be coming to fruition. And every month she would have this moment of disappointment when she realized that a child was not on the way. And so when she comes into the room, Elisha says to her, by this time next year, you will have a child. And she says, Lord, please don't say that to me. Because the thing that we all know is that hope deferred, the Bible says, makes the heart sick. In other words, she had given up on the fact that birth was going to be a part of the experience of her relationship with her husband. Because he was old and, and she was not as young as she used to be. And there are times when you are just going through the things that God has for you to do and you know that there are things that you have the potential to do and they just don't seem to happen the way that it seems that it should occur. And yet, here God is speaking to this woman through Elisha. And he's telling her, you are going to shift from barrenness to birth. Now, in order to really comprehend the depth of where she was, you have to understand how significant birth was in the Jewish community. If a woman could not give birth, they actually looked at her as though she was cursed by God. In other words, one of the ways the enemy is going to cause pain in your life or persecution in your life or problems in your life is he's going to attack you mentally. 
And he's going to use the wounds that he has inflicted on you to speak the messages of doom. But the Bible says in Jeremiah 30, 17, I will give you back your health and heal your wounds, says the Lord, for you are called an outcast. In other words, this woman was called an outcast by all the women who had children. And, and now they're talking about her because they know that her husband is probably too old. And so they weren't going to have any children. So every time she went to the well to get water, every time she went to the store to, to buy food, there were all the little whispers. And you understand how that happens sometimes in church. Little whispers, little groups, little quiet conversations. And then when you walk in the room, all the talk stops. And it hurts. And what the enemy wants you to do is give up and walk away and sit down. Because then you are not a threat. So the function of God's favor, first of all, shifts us from barrenness to birth. But the second thing is that it restores us by lifting us from loss to life. What you talking about, preacher? Well, Elisha made a promise. He said, within this time next year, you'll have a son. And sure enough, by that time next year, she was carrying a little baby. And he grew up, and he loved his dad so much. He wanted to go and be with him while he was at work. And so his mom let him go. And when he got there, he told his dad, my head is hurting. And his dad told the servant, take him to his mom. And before he could get home, the little boy had died. There will be times when you press through with the courage to serve, when what God promised begins, and then out of nowhere, it just gets snatched away. But the woman did not despair. Matter of fact, if you read the story in the fourth chapter of Second Kings, you'll see that she actually went immediately to Elisha. She found his servant, and his servant took her to Elisha, and she didn't even tell Elisha that the little boy had died. But Elisha was trying to figure out what the problem was because God had blocked what had occurred. And he, Elisha sent his servant ahead with his staff. He said, go put the staff on the little boy. When Elisha got there, the little boy was still dead. The thing that's interesting, Sharon, about this miracle is there was nothing before this that gave Elisha the indication that this little boy could be raised back to life. But what he did was he began to pray. Have you ever been in a season when without warning, what was most significant to you was just snatched away? Did it feel like what you lost would cost you your life? And was it worse if it was manipulated by someone else's behavior. What we have to do in these moments is stand on a promise. Psalm 71 verse 20 says, you have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. The word that's most important in there is but. The conjunction. 
See, the Bible does not guarantee us that we're not going to have pain. However, there is a but. The Bible doesn't guarantee us that we're not going to have disappointments. However, there is a but. And the but is that you will be restored to life again. No matter how it feels, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it sounds like, God is telling each and every one of us, as long as you stand on the promise of what I have given you in the word, you will have restoration. Whatever was taken away will be restored. And most of the time when God restores, when something has been taken away, he gives you more than you had than when you started. Job will tell you that story. He ended up with twice as much as he had after the enemy took it away from him. And so when Elisha was praying for this little boy, he felt the life force of God come back into that little boy's life, and he took him to his mother. In other words, whatever is taken away, God is saying, I will restore it to you. So we have a shift from barrenness to birth. In other words, the things that you know you have the potential for that just haven't seemed to happen, they're coming. A lifting from loss to life, that which was taken away from you will be restored. It will be given new life. It will be given new strength. And not only that, it's going to grow up and become what's going to be a blessing to you beyond your wildest imagination. And the last thing is, the function of God's favor is that he restores us by pushing us from poverty to prosperity. I don't preach much about prosperity. But that doesn't mean that I don't believe in prosperity. Because nature teaches us about prosperity. And that God wants us to be blessed. And he will bless us beyond our wildest imaginations when we have matured to the point where the blessing will be for his glory and not ours. So, here comes Elisha. There's going to be a famine in the land. You and your family, y'all need to go somewhere where the famine won't be. I could stay there a while, but I don't have time. It's like Elisha Things were just getting good. My little boy is doing well. He's growing up. My husband is doing well. The business is doing well. We are making as much money as we ever have and more than we will ever need, and we are just giving it away to bless God's people. And now you're telling us we have to leave it all. So they do like the Beverly Hillbillies. Pack up the family. and Well, they went to Philistine. Seven years went by. The Bible doesn't say it, but it infers it. That during that seven-year period, her husband died. Where is the, the reference? Remember I read that she went to the king? If her husband was alive and there was a problem with the property, he would have gone to the king. So the enemy places his hand on her. She comes back with no husband. He stole her, stole him. The enemy comes to steal. When she got home, there were squatters on their property. The enemy comes to kill. He killed the dream that they were coming home to restart where they left off. And then he comes to destroy 
they would not even return to them the money that they had made off of the land that they had stolen. Don't believe for a minute that because you say yes to Jesus, that the enemy is still not going to come to steal, kill, and destroy for you. He is. And the more you're aligned with God, the more he's coming after you. However, this is a but God moment. Because I only read verses one through three. Let's start at three and keep going. After the famine ended, she returned from the land of the Philistines and she went to see the king about getting back her house and land. As she came in, the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. Can I stop for a second? God is always going to provide a perfectly timed testimony. All right, y'all get this in a second. The king had just said, tell me some stories about the great things Elisha has done. Okay, I'm going to start again. And she came in. And the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. The king had just said, tell me some stories about the great things Elisha has done. Well, we know from the Bible that no one had ever raised anyone from the dead. So then Gehazi was telling the king about the time Elisha had brought a boy back to life. At the very moment, the mother of the boy walked in to make her appeal to the king about her house and land. Look, my lord, the king Gehazi exclaimed, here is a woman now, and this is her son, the very one Elisha brought back to life. Is it true, the king asked her, and she told him the story. So he directed, y'all with me? He directed one of his officials to see that everything she had lost was restored to her, including the value of any crops that had been harvested during her absence. Joel chapter 2, verse 25, the very first part of it says, the Lord says, I will give you back what you lost. So what has the enemy come to take from you? What has he tried to kill in you? What has he stolen from you? The thing that we need to really latch on to is one thing. The day will come when Jesus will knock on the devil's door. And when he knocks on the devil's door and the devil comes to the door, he's going to say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I've got the keys. Oh, and by the way, when I rose up from the grave, all authority in heaven, on earth, and under the earth was given to me. So that means I can use these keys anywhere I need to use them. So what I need for you to do is take your hands off of those individuals who you have jacked up. Take your hand off of their mind. Take your hand off of their emotions. Let them lose and let them go. Because when we decide that we will activate the courage to serve, no matter how much it hurts in the moment of the attack, no that the favor of God is coming to restore you. And just in case you don't know how he did it, he got on a cross and he died. But you know, that's just not the end of the story. Because the enemy thought on Friday that he had won. 
but he could not keep him in the grave. And when he rose up, he had the power of redemption. And redemption is the key to restoration. In other words, what Adam and Eve gave away, Jesus redeemed to us. All we have to do is choose to live in the authority and power that God has given. Yes. Disappointments come. Hurt happens. But God will always restore. His name was Henry Morehouse. He was a traveling preacher. He had come to America to do several evangelistic meetings. And back in those days, they were done in tents. And he was in a town and he was just going around meeting the people so that he knew who they were, he knew what they were going through, he could be able to relate to them. And he was walking down the street and there was a little boy, maybe four years old, maybe five years old, who was walking out of the country store. And he had a bottle of milk. Now, Phil, you're not old enough to know about bottles of milk. Uh, when I was a kid, the milkman used to come and deliver the milk in a milk box every morning. But before I was a kid, you had to go someplace with your bottle and they would fill it up and you would take it home and you would have your milk. And so the little boy was walking out of the store and just lost his balance and stumbled and tumbled and fell and all of the milk went on the ground and the bottle crashed into a hundred pieces. And the little boy began to weep. So Morehouse goes over to the little boy. He says, what's the matter? Are you hurt? And the little boy says, no, I'm not hurt, but my mama's going to whoop me. He said, why is your mama going to whoop you? Because I broke her best bottle. She told me to be careful. He said, well, son, come with me. And they walked into a store. He bought a new pitcher. And then he went back to the country store and had it filled up. And then he put the little fellow up on his shoulders and he carried the milk bottle this time. And had the little fellow tell him, tell him how to get to his house. And then when he got to the house, he put the little fellow on the porch and handed him the bottle. And he says, is your mama going to whoop you now? And he says, no, she's going to be happy. And he said, and why is she going to be happy? He said, because, sir, the bottle you bought is way nicer than the one that I broke. Watch this now. When the enemy broke you, God was standing right there. When you started to cry, he comes over to you. And he says, my son, my daughter, what, what's the matter? I'm afraid. I broke the best bottle. And he says, let me make you brand new. Paul says it best. We are new creations in Christ. So this is what I'm going to say. If you haven't been hurt, go ahead and align yourself to be hurt so that you can understand the joy of his restoration. If you have been hurt, claim the promises and allow him to restore you and to bring you to the place of newness that he has planned for our lives from the very beginning. And by activating the courage to serve, you will also become the one who takes the news that restoration is possible. Father, we thank you. It's hard to say thank you for the pain. It's, it's hard to say thank you for the persecution. It's hard to say thank you for the problems, but it's in those arenas that we see you at your best. 
So for those who are gathered around, taking this message in, who may have been discouraged, who may have been beaten down, who may have been despondent and ready to quit, or had already given up, restore us. If this is the first time you're hearing about Jesus, I will tell you he's the best thing that ever happened in your life. Claim him as Lord. Let him wash all of our sins away. And then activate the courage to serve gifts that you have been given and watch what he does through you in Jesus name